expectation that it is falling. And sorry, got uh, application windows all over the place. All right, 7.04 is as good a time to start as any. Thank you everyone for being here at Fusion's monthly members meeting for April, April? May the 3rd of April. Oh, apologies, fallen at the first hurdle. Uh, for the month of May 2023. Um, yes, uh, first Wednesday of the month as always. Um, and I'm I'm signed in from Gadigal land, part of the Eora Nation, and pay my respect to Gadigal elders, past and present. The Fusion Party does, um, interestingly, on um, Indigenous Affairs, the Fusion Party has a policy of supporting the voice to Parliament as was recommended by the um, Uluru Statement from the Heart, but there's nuance sort of coming out around that issue now that there's obviously the yes vote that's going to be campaigned for in an upcoming referendum and there is a no vote that the Conservative side and the Liberal Party is going to be campaigning on. Um, but there's also a no vote from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander activists. So there's nuance there that um, I think will be important for us to um, become familiar with in the coming months so that we can be uh, clear in our ideas. Uh, but that is a, a discussion for the upcoming weeks. Um, tonight, one of the things we'll be talking about is, in, on the policy uh, side is the cost of housing. It's kind of an everything problem, the cost of housing. It's It makes up the majority of most household budgets. So if housing was not so expensive, a lot of people would be in a lot less uh, financial stress. All right, so tonight, um, just quickly have a look at a few things we've been doing, including the Australian Republic discussion. That was nice. Have a quick update on membership and finance check in on our um, AEC Electoral Commission membership check and then talk about some policy work that's been going on. Uh, so a couple of weeks ago, we had Andrew Fraser from the Australian Republic Movement come and speak with us. It was nice. It was in the bit of a, a fireside chat with 16 or 17 members who were interested in the topic of how would Australia become a republic and what difference would it make? And I think one of the points that came out of it was, you know, in our day-to-day -day lives, it's not that big a deal, but it's a, um, uh, symbolically it is huge cutting those last ties to the monarchy and it's a, um, an act of a mature nation. Um, anyone else that was there, welcome to jump in and give your thoughts on it. Anyone else has thoughts? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I thought it was interesting. There was, um, I think, the 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 the, uh, the pitch uh, in general was very measured. Um, it was uh, I, there was some some questions asked by one one for myself um, in terms of the what were the important things to what, like the, the the most important um, arguments or the strongest arguments around doing so um, and they were sort of um, not the strongest, I guess. I mean, I think it was considered important, but there was a, there seemed to be a, a desire to recognize that it wasn't necessarily the most important thing. So uh, I, th I think you could probably find different opinions on that in different places. Um, so a potentially stronger advocate uh, adv advocates for it. Um, but there was a, there was a certain amount of support from some members in the, uh, in the room as well. Yep. I'd, yeah, so it was pretty measured. Austin? Austin, are you there? Give it a couple seconds and otherwise we'll go on to Tyrone and come back. Okay, to sorry, <laughs> sorry. I figured out how to unmute myself finally. Very um, high tech savvy. I didn't attend, um, but I'm pretty familiar with the Australian Republic movement's stance. And my take is that they are 
their strategy is to play small target politics and say how little would change. And I think that that's a lot of trouble to go to to achieve a little. Um, and that, it, you know, when people talk about the voice to parliament, um, the criticism from the left, from Indigenous Australians, is that what we want is a treaty, not a voice to parliament. And I think the two things can be done together. So in Bolivia and Ecuador, Bolivia was the first country to do this and also the first country, first colonised country um, in, in the first country in the Americas to have an Indigenous head of state, um, Evo Morales. He, they had what's called a plurinational republic. So that means you take recognition of First Nations people um, and you build that into the constitution. And you do that, why not do that at the same time as um, throwing off the last chains of British, just give you know, make it a bigger thing, not a smaller thing. So it's worth all the trouble, and there's and there's something to believe in apart from how everything's going to be the same, and you can still have a sausage roll, right? Um, the uh, the other thing is when people talk about it, there always there's always this assumption that we've got such a great system and we don't want to mess with it, and everything's wonderful about Australian democracy, um, including the fact that the Parliament can throw out the leader of the country at any time, does so frequently. Um, and, you know, often when they're, uh, often replaces them with a less popular person. Um, and, you know, the, the, the Howard to, to, to Keating transition was the first of a, of a long tradition of popular Australian leaders being tossed out by um, their own party. People who they basically get elected because we end up having presidential style um, uh, elections and then people vote on the leader and then they don't get to have that leader. So I think, you know, having a, a strong presidential office, not a weak governor general who's elected um, is a feature, not a bug. And people say, oh, we'll just be like America. It's like, well, you have to imagine, would America be better or worse if the Senate had more power and the president had less, right? Right now, you know, and if you look at approval ratings in the US and, and other places that do it, leaders, executive leaders tend to have um, much, much better approval ratings than uh, legislatures. Legislatures are generally held to be held as extremely unpopular, corrupt institutions that people don't like, whereas about 50 percent of people tend to like any the leader on a given day. And I think um, there's a there's a there's a, there's a sort of. Uh, elitist strain in Australian politics that says, well, don't worry, nothing will change. The same people will be in charge if we have a republic. And that's the opposite of what I want. I want a republic precisely because it'll shake, shake everything up and give us an opportunity to change everything. Yeah, thanks for that contribution. I can tell you've thought about this. And there's certainly a lot of things that people talk about with regards to the Australian constitution that, um, you know, maybe we don't look at it enough as being a living document that should change with the times when we look at it as a uh, something unmovable and just because I rambled a bit key point Bolivia plurinational republic that's the example we should be looking at Evo mm. Morales yeah thanks for dropping that one in there and I did say to have that point there what next so um you know hopefully this will feed into some policy discussions Tyrone thanks Andrea and thanks for that Austin uh, I tend to agree that if we're going to go to the all the trouble of redoing the constitution and becoming a republic, we may as well go all in and go big or go home. Uh, but there just there was general consensus from the meeting. I think that um, at this stage, a republic is fairly low on the agenda because there's so much else that needs addressing in Australia. Um, and whilst it would be nice to have a republic, uh, you know, it's it's not something that's at the at the forefront of people's desire within the country. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I think that was a, a worthwhile point making that uh, we can improve people's lives uh, by doing incre incremental change as well as something more bold and radical. Yeah, I guess it's a matter of whether it would actually delay other action. It sort of reminds me of how I got into electoral politics and it was on, it was when the metadata retention bill came in and I thought, oh, here's a party that fights for digital rights. And then I got into politics and realised, oh, we've got to 
decide whether we want to keep burning coal or stop burning coal. So there was, there's always more, always more to do. And maybe the risk there is to say, well, if, how long are we going to wait if we think this is important? Yeah. Lots of views all around. Um, yeah, so ideally this will feed into some policy development and when I say what next, I mean not just for this point, but also for um, in general, what are we going to talk about next? Who will be our next guest speaker? Um, maybe some of the points later on will illuminate some of the uh, priority areas for policy that our members want to talk about. Bryony? Thanks, Andrea. Yeah, I think you can divvy up. I like the point that Tyrone just made because when I heard we were going to do a talk on Republic, you know, my immediate reaction is, oh my God, there's so many immediate priorities, things we need to be dealing with. I think in terms of what a government, you know, government doing too many things at once, if you divvy them up by department, it uh, it can work. I think. So you just can't give one department too much to do, too much reform to do at any one time. Mm. That's all. Why do you guys want to uh, spoil the coronation party in a few days? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's fine. You can still be the, the king of the United Kingdom. Sorry, I've just uh, been, just had some it looks like there's not an email going out with a link to the um, to this event, so I'll just check that now, if we don't mind taking a 30-second detour while I have a look there, just in case anyone is RSVPing now. Miles, is this real, the, the watch party in Brisbane for the coronation? Yeah, we're going to play some drinking games. Okay, cool. <laughs> See who can uh, spot... Prince Andrew in the crowd. <laughs> Obviously, every, no one's going to get yeah, drunk he, on that one. Every time someone <laughs> mentions the sacred stone, you have to drink. <laughs> the stone of scone, is that it? Well, it looks like it looks like there is a... This link is going out in the email, so hopefully there's no one sitting around waiting for that. Sorry if that is happening. Um, yes, okay, so... I mean, the way this got organised was that um, it was just a matter of someone being in touch with the speaker and getting in touch with Fusion organisers to say, hey, can we have this event? And um, it aligned with our desire to talk about Australian democracy. So these things happen when someone decides to organise them. So if you're thinking of something, please uh, talk about it and get it to happen. Cool. All right. Let's move on to a very quick update on our membership. So we've had the um, the AEC, the Electoral Commission, call us up as they do between each election to every small party to say, hey, do you actually have 1,500 members? They don't do this to parties who have members in parliament. If you're a parliamentary party, you're home free. You can have zero members if you want, but Parties without an elected member have to prove they have 1,500 members, and we do that by providing a membership list. So everyone here, if you are a member, then you should have an email or an SMS from us, and hopefully you've replied to confirm your details because we need to have those um, address details accurate and matching the electoral roll. If you are a member and haven't got anything from us, please let us know. We might have a, a broken email or incorrect phone number for you. So we've actually, um, in the process of going through our membership, we are down 64 members since the end of March, but we are more confident that these members actually want to be members of Fusion because we've made uh, a lot of phone calls in addition to the emails and SMSs to uh, confirm people's, not only their addresses, but their um, continued commitment to be a member of the party. And the only... Um, obligation that this membership check imposes is that the AEC might call you. They won't call everyone. They'll call a, a sample of members or maybe send an email and ask, are you a member of Fusion um, 
science, pirate, secular, climate emergency, and you just have to say, yes, um, it's me, Andrea Leong, and I am a member of the party. So we'll, uh, we'll send out some more comms when that check is about to start. So thank you everyone for responding so far to our membership check. Oh. So far, uh, yeah, um, out of the people who have responded or the people who pass, um, those two together, uh, yeah, 1,302 people now. So, um, oh, and that, that doesn't include the pirates. Yeah. Ah, right, okay. So that's getting very close to where we can be confident that all of our members uh, know what's going on. So this is, yeah, that's very uh, confidence inspiring. Um, any questions about that? Otherwise we'll have a quick financial update. All right, Michael, our treasurer. Cool, thanks very much. Um, so very, very quick, um, if I can. So profit and loss. Uh, so this is of the, of, of, uh, as of the. Oh, Michael's video is frozen. We'll send him a message. No, how's that? Land a little bit more. Um, Sorry, Michael, uh, your video froze there. Uh, hopefully that chills out. I've had some weird internet things today. Um, so apologies if I cut out a bit. Um, but yeah, basically a bit of a busy month uh, just in that there are some additional expenses that we need to pay for uh, as, as part of the uh, membership check. So some of that is those SMSs that uh, you've all likely received or a lot of you have likely received. Um, there's a fair bit of that on top of our normal monthly expenses around so sort of some of the IT costs and various sort of keeping the lights on costs. Um, in donations, three hundred twenty-three dollars uh, in donations. That's pretty steady of our of our monthly um, recurring donations. Um, but it is a net negative month in this in this case, which I mean, it does happen sometimes. Um, it's it's going to happen when we have important things to spend. Um, and upcoming quite soon is going to be our uh, nation builder spend, which we pay annually. Um, and that's going to be, uh, I think, I always forget exactly what it is when it comes to this, but it is, I think it's a close to 1500 to 2000. Um, so that will be a big uh, spending month um, as well. So um, yeah, if we move on to the next slide, which is just the balance sheet. Um, so something and say there that nation builder is the service that um, sorts out our website membership and emails yeah it's also the payment gateway for donations and uh yeah it handles a whole lot of things it's, uh, it's something we've looked at potentially replacing uh certain points or various things we've always looked at that we looked at different solutions over and over again but it's uh uh it, it's it, it is it's expensive technically but it does a lot for us so um uh yeah so uh, and then just yeah, on the balance sheet, there's a, a fair bit of stuff here that of sort of out some outstanding reimbursements and things like that. Um, there's a uh, accounts receivable, which is sort of some adjustments around donations around the um, uh, around the uh, the, the election, the Aston by election. Uh, so some things will to be sort of adjusted in there, but this um, that's why you have a balance sheet so you can actually keep track of this stuff. Uh, and our net assets currently sitting at sort of $4,575.65. Uh, $4, That's um, so, I mean, we're kind of, uh, we're, we're sitting around a bit lower than um, we have a little bit sort of, sort of uh, historically or in the last while, primarily because we've just had a bunch of big spends. So obviously the, the Aston by election and, um, and this sort of this membership check. So um, over the next few months, we'll probably want to start looking at uh, ramping up some donation drives and or just a reminder of obviously that uh, all donations up to a certain threshold are tax deductible. Um, and we can provide more information on that if if needs be. Um, so we'll, we'll reach out and as always, thank you to everyone who has donated. Um, so I'll leave it at that unless anyone has any questions. No. Cool. All right, great. Thank you, Michael. Uh, and you might be up again, uh, Michael, as we talk about what the Policy Development Committee has been up to. Yeah, yeah. cool. Thanks. Um, so um, I might ask to actually, if you can give me screen sharing again, I, I'll see if I can pull up that. Oh, uh, yeah, might have to with me for a moment. So as <clears throat> if, uh, if you're able to do that, I can um, just pull this information up. I thought I had it ready, but I do not apparently. So I get it, but as I as I preamble, um, so uh, we do have a um, uh, so a little while ago we sent out a, an email 
with a survey. Uh, it was a couple, or with, with, it was two links. One was around the sort of a general intake form for policy suggestions. Uh, and a few people have put sent some things through to that, which um, we, we have uh, seen and we, we are actioning. Um, and there was another one that was sent through that was that had in it a, uh, a survey that was more of a once off to look into the idea of um, uh, sort of policy priorities among the membership. Now, uh, unfortunately, um, this this survey was accidentally sent at a as a uh, an older as, a, as an older draft version. Um, so there were some typos, and the information, the questions that were in there, were unfortunately not the, the the final versions that we were intending to send. So if you did see that and fill that out, you probably might have noticed a few weird things in there. Um, wasn't as it didn't. Uh, it didn't look as it didn't look as great as it uh, as it should have. Um, however, by the point we sort of realised we'd had a close to I think close to 150 or so responses, um, people responded very very quickly, um, and um, the data in there is is still uh, relative uh, is still quite useful. Now, um, uh, first of all, just a big thanks to Drew who uh, put through put has sort of put this together and put some slides. Um, I'm just going to share my screen now. And um, oh. that's <laughs> I'll I put that up, and then it went to full screen, and then ah, I see it's it's because I'm on this. Um, so uh, it's so with this member survey, um, I'll run through this relatively quickly. Um, open to people to sort of jump in and um, uh, through some questions out if you like. Um, but uh, yeah, so. Um, the, the the main thing was to, for us to just ask what were the main sort of important areas around uh, based on some very very broad sort of broad topics we wanted to keep sort of things relatively broad um, and some of the things were sort of fairly ex expected but the um, some some important things to um, to kind of recognize is obviously as a, as a as a party made of lots of different parties there's lots of there are lots of differing beliefs and uh, some things that are, are, are pretty universally accepted and some that are a little bit more contentious. So um, one of the probably not surprising climate environment um, is a is is had uh, sort of the most uh, number of people saying it was the uh, uh, a, a five here. Um, these weren't competing against each other. This was basically just a uh, what um, basically for each of these issues, uh, how to sort of how does each person score it? So, um, a, a quite quite a significant portion sort of put put um, climate environment at five, um, as well as sort of um, uh, cost of living and science research, education, health. Uh, so, I mean, th this is a, a general. Um, this was this these were sort of the, these six items were the ones that were that sort of had the highest uh, weighting of, of importance there. Um, now, uh, we also added a, just a section to add some free text so people could put in some of their own um, sort of uh, own things, which I'm glad we did again because we were missing a lot of categories in the in the draft version. Um, but there were a number of uh, sort of uh, common um, items. So Drew had gone through and just sort of collated and and, and added a number of the ones together. Um, so yeah, Indigenous Australians, uh, human and animal rights. Um, the in interesting one there was some, uh, there was a fair few calls around nuclear power um, and, and, and is in, in being in favour of nuclear power. Uh, corruption in government, uh, church and government, um, yeah, trans related issues and anti corporate economist, uh, economics. So uh, there was a fair few sort of a wide sort of a widespread of these things. And um, yeah, obviously, these were important enough. Um, obviously, all these are all these are very important. And um, uh, very uh, important enough to many members that um, it was important to sort of fill that in in that in that free text space. Um, now, the, the next question, and this was one that I was really interested in, um, was it was a similar question to the first, but uh, it was how important are these particular topics to, uh, how, what, how much, how, how, what, how do we think, how important do we think these other topics are to the general Australian public? So it, it, it matters, obviously, what our members, like we want to be representative of the members with, with our policy and with the way that the, uh, we all sort of represent the party. Um, but it is important to make sure that we uh, consider the the um, uh, 
the sort of the overall population, what is important to everyone. And um, there were some, uh, I don't, I'm not quite sure why there's a uh, thing over this. I don't know if that was there before. Uh, this, oh, no, that's just a new um, amplification of that. So um, yeah, so there was two particular items that um, were yeah, overwhelmingly identified as, as the biggest areas. And those were different to, uh, quite different to the weightings of the general membership. So I think that's one, one interesting takeaway from that from my perspective is just, I think fusion membership is, um, is thinking about the wider population um, and, and sort of understanding. I, I, it's, 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 it's good to see that the, um, that sort of the membership is thinking about sort of all Australians in that regard, because as much as we, again, we're representative of the membership, um, that's, it's sort of, we want to be representing all of Australia if we can. Um, I've got a few, got a few hands up, so I'll just, I'll just stop to, um, to this. Uh, Miles, are you on camera or are you uh, over to take? Nope, I'm off camera. Uh, uh, oh, okay. Pirates just, just... have uh, recently uh, are in are have pretty much concluded a very similar survey uh, to do with policy interests. So uh, once we've gone through and um, fixed that up, because there's some atrocious data quality issues with it, but once it's cleaned up, then I'll be open sourcing it, and obviously I'll bring that over to Fusion as well to um, to help inform that. We had a um one of the preliminary issues I've noticed with the data is that uh, just just like this poll here, there seemed to be kind of a bias towards supporting or, or strongly supporting the issues listed, and I realized that was a problem in that I did in the survey design where I um and I, I put this out for feedback as well when seeking um, policy issues for pirates to put feedback on, and I realized the bias we had was that we were only we only thought about issues we were. Uh, we we thought were really important that we wanted to make action on. And so there was kind of like a selection bias there. So I think for next time, we'll definitely have to take that into account. Um, cool. Uh, Owen? Yeah, I noticed the um, ABC by Compass, they tend to do the same thing. Like which of these policies that the Liberals and Labor are talking about, do you care about the most? Yeah. But um, I was thinking well, with the education policy, um, did you guys see um, this morning I heard um, this education company, Chegg, they sell um, subscriptions to like homework help. Um, yeah, their shares crashed 49% the other day. Um, all these people are using ChatGPT instead. And um, I guess like, you know, I don't see any of the major, I don't see any political parties talking about, um, you know, how ChatGPT is going to change, you know, countries. Um, I think, yeah, if we get ahead of the curve here, um, could be, you know, good for keeping our position as like, um, you know, these people are like scientific, they understand technology. Yeah. Sure. Um, yeah. Um, I think there's uh, some, some quick note of just, there is a few things, um, I mean, that I, I'm not as, uh, happy with, with the, with the results of the survey, just that we weren't able to collect as much in the way of sort of demographic data and, um, and, and, and things that would sort of allow us to kind of utilize the data a bit more. Um, but um, I think it's still uh, something that's still quite interesting to see. Um, Austin? I think you've just preempted my, I was going to ask about the demographics of our, the survey and how, whether the, you know, there's a, there's a, um, we're a distinct group in terms of beliefs. Um, and I'm sure we're also a distinct group in terms of demographics and probably um, frightfully young and urban and so forth and, and all of those things, which would be better to, to which would be interesting to know. But I, I think, as you just said, you, you wish you knew more. Oh, I think you muted yourself part way through as you were finishing that. Um, um, but yes, definitely the, um, the, uh, that there are certainly uh, that there's a few things to sort of take with a grain of salt with this data. Um, mostly, so I mean, it could have been that um, the people who were available or able to take um, that were just the folks who were uh, able to see the email or, or, or had more access to the email that, that that this was sent in, and there maybe there's some heavy, heavy sort of heavy weight towards certain groups. Um, I, ideally, uh, this is something we can do, sort of. Like it's not the only time we can do it again, and we can put more time into um, maybe trying to trying to catch the data more meaningfully, and obviously trying to actually send the final version of the of the survey. Um, 
uh but uh yeah i mean i think um again it is worth it is worthwhile data still um it is still useful um but yeah we we will we will take those things into account uh andrea yeah i think it's just very interesting here that um people have identified the cost of living that's something i'd expect but as being important to the majority of australians but that our members also think that science and research is not important to the majority of Australians. And, you know, I'm not trying to argue with that point. I just find it interesting that it, that we have that result. That's all. Yeah. I, I mean, if I was to think of that, my, my assumption would be that um, uh, there's a common experience of, uh, at least from my experience with, with uh, the science party uh, in, in, in the past before we were fusion um, is that um, is 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 that uh, a, a very common frustration? Is that um, not not sort of other parties um, other than and, and and so I think the the other branch parties sort of in, included in um, in these kinds of experiences uh, that other, the other the major parties as well as um, various communities just sort of don't um, yeah don't don't have the uh, don't don't have the right takes or don't um, focus enough on these certain things. It's why people sort of uh, did, did come and came, did come and join the science party or uh, pirates and and uh, uh, and for, for, for particular issues um, because yeah, the, the, I mean it's, it's just not covered. But maybe the end. But I, I think it's worth recognizing that certain things. Um, and again, this is just the opinions of of members, but um, it is important to recognize that certain issues that we might want to uh, get behind um, may be really important. And it doesn't mean we, uh, but uh, it doesn't mean we shouldn't pursue them if they are not popular or if they're not sort of topical. Um, but we do need to consider that in terms of where we spend our efforts and. Um, how we try to sort of spread our message and 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 the, the things that we focus on. Um, so I'll I'll continue just uh, further. Um, so the next question I had was basically uh, what what was the what what policy area should we be focusing on for expansion within the poli within the policy platform? Um, this was more it was could have been worded as something instead like uh if you could only, if we could only work on one what would it, what would it be i wanted it to be sort of more of a sort of pick one and move forward um there was there was a the spread where the highest ones we had were climate environment uh housing and the cost of living and jobs welfare and tax now uh housing as we'll be talking about later is the uh, is, is the topic of the current working group. So this is the one that we are focusing on at the moment. So obviously it's a very, very important um, topic to um, the majority of Australians right now. And um, yeah, we'll be sort of continuing on more of that, um, more with that shortly. Um, and then, yeah, other heavy, other sort of comments had heavy focuses on uh, trans rights and uh, there was a fair few in favor of land tax uh, as well as nuclear power, um, but some, I think some specifically um, excluding it going at, in, in, uh, excluding nuclear submarines. Um, uh, so uh, the next question there was around what is the most controversial policy area? Um, so it was, it was, some of it was, uh, I believe the, the 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 question itself was are there any particular policies that you do disagree with? Um, there were quite a lot that just said that that, that didn't answer this question. Um, that were said so they were relatively um, happy with the with the sort of the policy platforms, um, but uh, yeah, nuclear was the one that came up uh, a lot. Um, however, there was actually quite a lot of a split between for for these nuclear responses. Um, there were a few. Uh, three there that said that people were we were too pro nuclear, and six that said we weren't nuclear enough. Uh, now, I think uh, again being being sort of careful with any particular takeaways with this this sort of information, but uh, at least for me the takeaway is is not necessarily that we should uh, take a particular position because of this, but uh, it's important in with something that is contentious and also complicated that we make sure we do take a, a nuanced approach to assessing these things. So uh, we can't. Mm. Um, so uh, 
Sorry, Michael, your internet's bugging out. Uh, yeah, I think other things that the respondents didn't like or the hate message. Uh, classifying aging as a disease. So this is one that has been uh, very commonly raised as um, sort of contentious. Uh, there have been a lot of times where when it's explained or uh, th th that, it, that it would be that it is sort of received a little bit better. Um, but I think regardless, a lot of this uh, stuff, a, a lot of these experiences or this feedback does indicate that it's very much worth uh, reviewing in terms of how we how we market or how we explain uh, this one as um, there are lots of it, it's 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 a very easy one for, for people to either to um, uh, misinterpret or um, kind of take in a, in a in a sort of a context that we don't mean. Um, so, um, yeah. So the one, so one, just sort of general. Um, that uh, yeah, one in particular as well that people came up was around our policy on First Nations. So, um, yep. Several people felt that area needed work, and it cropped up as a common thread from start to finish. While most people felt it was in the right general area, some identified having strong feelings about it enough to mention resigning from the party over it. So, uh, it's. Once again, uh, it's something that um, we do need to make sure that sort of we address. There's a lot of things within the policy platform that we need to expand on and work on, and it's important that we do it to a to a standard, uh, to a sort of a high standard of evidence, and that we put uh, we sort of give things the attention they deserve. Uh, resources are limited, and um, we will do as best as we can. Um, we're going to sort of within the PDC try to make a, a, a better effort to um, sort of advertise and get people involved as we're as we're going through this. Um, but uh, yeah, we'll be we'll be sort of keeping in touch and hopefully we can really address some of these policies uh, and, and and expand this platform as much as possible over the next while, especially uh, as we sort of plan and and strategize for the for the for the whichever the next elections that come up are. Um, so that's the end of the slides there. Um, I'll, I'll sort of close that down. Now. I'll, I'll, I'll stop sharing if uh, you want to take over again, Andrea, um, to bring back those slides. Um, are there any questions specifically more about that um, before we sort of move on? Just also just conscious of time with um, 20 minutes so left. Yeah, that's right. There's actually nothing else on the agenda, so we can have a chat about this or we can bring up some other topics. Uh, yep, yeah, I mean, there were some some items just on that slide. I didn't put necessarily a lot of items on that slide around the other PDC stuff, but there's a few other things to, to mention, um, mostly around the, the sort of the state of the housing uh, policy group. Um, so Austin, was that a, gonna be a question around the survey stuff or? No, it was I, gonna be about interest rates, but if you're gonna talk about housing, do that first and but maybe we can roll interest rates into that maybe. Just with yeah. the RBA decision, I wanted to know what the the party's position is on um, interest rates. Yep, for sure, for sure. Um, we can we can speak to that shortly. Um, Tyrone, do you want to go first before I uh, continue? Yeah, I was just going to ask. I have a uh, nuclear energy policy proposal. Um, how do I go about getting PDC to investigate that? Um, so, um, I th think we can speak to that, uh, let me, I'll, I'll try to speak to this as I can sort of briefly. Um, I would say the first thing would be to, uh, push that forward through into that, the general intake form. Um, I will see if I can provide that and put that in the chat again, just for anyone else who needs it. Um, the idea will be, so right now we're, we're sort of, we're focusing on this sort of the, the housing, um, uh, working work stream. Uh, but we do want to make sure that we can get more things sort of uh, more things going in parallel um, uh, as, as as soon as we can. So I think um, uh, if with 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 anything that is proposed, anything that is uh, sort of especially it has already lots of work done on it. Um, I think it's something we should be trying to uh, focus on when we can and 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 and, and getting moving. Um, but yeah, I would I would get that through into that intake form, um, and then we can um, we'll, we'll we'll do our best to. Uh, sort of get some movement on it as soon as we can. Cool, thanks. Uh, Owen? 
Oh yeah, um, maybe maybe not just a question for you, Michael. Maybe for all the policy committee. But I guess yeah, when, when you were saying, I got the impression like in the survey, you know, somebody says they care about this policy, therefore we you know better do it. But where is there like some sort of line? Like if I say, um, what's Fusion's policy on space mining? Like why doesn't Fusion have a policy on space mining? What a terrible party! Um, like where do you draw the line? Like this isn't like we're not gonna you know we don't have to have a policy on everything. Um, well, I mean, in terms of what we do have a policy on, I mean, it's going to be whether or not is there is a sort of agreed upon sort of position or policy on something. I mean, it's it's sort of it's just whether or not we've gone through the process of, of creating it or and endorsing it. Um, if we don't have a policy on it, we that's that's all we can really say. Uh, we can speak generally to um, how these things will fit to our values and things like that. There's ways to ways to talk about that that would give it a decent understand idea of, of of what we would um, of of what position we are most likely to take. Um, but yeah, I mean, we, we, we will need to sort of prioritize certain things. Um, uh, if, if we could have a position on absolutely everything, I, I, we would, but it's just a matter of the resources we can spend on, uh, on, on those things. On, yeah, on sort of developing okay. those policies out. Um, um, yeah, so I, I wanted to just speak just briefly, um, on the, uh, the, the, the housing policy working stream. So just really quickly, um, the as has been sort of mentioned before, the, there's a, the PDC has sort of put together a, uh, a procedure um, for the purposes of uh, complex topics and complex uh, policy development. Um, and the housing policy, ho housing affordability is about as complex as a topic that we could have picked for the first uh the, the first run through of this uh, for for better or for worse uh it's it's a very very complex very very difficult but it's also a really important one um the 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 procedure that we we are working with um it's one that is uh very very important um the that there's some some sort of really important um uh factors that we are sort of it, it's based around and a lot of it is around the idea that um it's very important for us to all be on the same page uh, with th th these kinds of discussions. It's very easy for people to come at things from sort of different philosophical ideas or understandings of the facts um, and prioritization of, of sort of factors that, that sort of the go that go into this. Um, and so the procedure as we're, we're as we're going through it um, is uh, the, the, it goes through three phases. So the first phase is problem identification, and so that is to sort of look about look at the underlying reality of of what things what sort of what's happening now. So rather than um, look at anything aspirational or anything just just yet, or looking at particular implementation, we just really want to make sure we we all understand and have a good idea of of what the current situation is. Um, the second phase is around looking at outcomes. So. Again, we're sort of just before we do any kind of anything around implementation, uh, we want to uh, just figure out what, like basically if the first phase is where we've come, uh, where we are right now, the second phase is where we want to get to. And then the third phase after that will be actual implementation. Um, so on the, along those, uh, Is that a Zoom freeze again? Johnson has been working um, on collecting the submissions that we've had so far on there and and, and collating that. Um, and we will be moving into the second phase and opening that up for submissions this evening as we as we sort of move into the housing, uh, the housing um, the, the next working group meeting session uh, after this in 12 minutes. Um, so uh, I believe I've just been notified Peter, PJ actually is Peter Johnson, the name is usually different. Um, Peter, would you like to take over for a while and um, uh, speak on, on, on this part of the process? Yeah, good day, everyone. Hi, I hope you can hear me. Just confirm you can, yes? Yeah. Yeah, yeah cool, cool. Um, look, the development of policy that's earth shattering, that is... Uh, country forming that is evolutionary, that is take, able to solve very intricate and inbred problems in our society is a task that um, requires an analysis of the fundamentals. 
of much of our social makeup. And when it comes to housing, there's really three broad sectors that are affected by the principle of affordability housing, which is the main focus of the working group. Um, the first one is what proportion of your income, you know, what amount of money do you have, wherever you source it from, is actually utilised to pay for your housing. But inherent in that is appropriateness of housing, uh, which is really related to factors such as is it safe? Is it adequate for your family? Is there appropriate infrastructure, et cetera? So I don't want to go into those details, but um, when we look at those factors, we, we see a state of play in Australia, which it's obvious and everyone knows it, that the, the, there's sort of four broad groups. There is a genuine homeless on the side of the road, in tents around the country, in emergency accommodation, staying at churches, couch surfing, etc. And their numbers are around about 120,000 people on any given night. Um, there is the rental market, which about 80% of it is private rental from uh, private land, land or house owners. And 20% is then the state uh, owned housing or territory owned housing or other sort of morphs of that, which is a friends let you rent somewhere or you're renting uh, a caravan at the back of someone's property and extensions of that principle of rental. It could be marinas, it could be uh, a wide spectrum. Um, so we've actually got about 30%, 33% of the population renting in Australia which equates to about 3 million households are in that market. There's probably another 3 million or so that own a home, but have a mortgage. Many of them may have had a mortgage for some period of time, but others have taken on a mortgage in the last four or five years, which means that they are extremely, they have, they have a large loan on their property, they are now very susceptible to rising interest rates and they're very susceptible to housing devaluations. And if any of those crises hit them of substance, that's a life changing event for them in terms of both financial loss, credit worthiness and the willingness to do it again. And the other 30% own their homes outright, uh, which are generally the older generation, so the 50s and above. So if we look at affordable housing, the main sectors that are affected are, uh, I guess, probably close to half of the rental market, maybe slightly more. They're in a position where their disposable income uh, sits close to 30% of their cost for rental. And that's the RBAs and very broad international guidance of what is housing stress. Um, the other areas, of course, is the newly mortgaged, which I mentioned, and of course, the homeless. So we then take a look at where we've been going through is then effectively assessing very broad fundamentals of the situation in Australia. Is it a right to own your home, to have a habitat, it's an essential right that should be protected in the constitution and laws? and therefore should be uh, called to legal assessment when it's not provided by the state? Or is it a need? And if it's a need, then what, what characteristics and what's the current legal foundations? Um, there's also elements associated with uh, the stakeholders in the supply chain of housing and why it's been so artificially inflated at the very significant, you know, enormous rates of inflation of housing, uh, less so for rental, but housing for certain, and the burden of that. I guess the reason I introduced all of that sort of broad spiel was to emphasise that no matter what policy section we may attack as a new party, we always have, we have the choice of whether we do a band aid or we do the rest like everyone else is doing, which is 
short, sharp solutions which appeal appealing, which there's beneficiaries that are desperate and others that, that are probably badly affected that don't really care? Or do we look at the intricacies of our social foundations and how do we deal with a solution that is suitable for the current and for future generations? And I guess what I'm seeing on the current political spectrum on housing, uh, noting that it's been a whole uh, national cabinet that's met on it recently, noting that it's been a topic of conversation for the last 18 months, uh, pointing to some cabinet and budget solutions coming up later this month, is I continuously see um, very much band-aids taking shape that has been going on for you know, 40, 40 years now. And the reason that happens is that the economic infrastructure is so dependent upon that current housing model to be perpetuated that there are major financial capital assets and losses that are liking to flow to prosperous, middle-class, even lower middle-class Australian aspirations should the model change. And the challenge with any national policy that we want to bring forward is how to transition current social development to achieve these broad aspirations. And I'll just leave you with one final point, and I'll leave it at that. Look, some of these options are, can be quite earth shattering and not readily apparent to people that have lived in one particular dogma or mentality about how society should run for some time. But it's, a, it's an obvious reality that Australia has a lot of land. It's an obvious reality that a lot of that land is available for residential uh, low cost or self-developed housing. It's also a reality that that land was not created by human effort or human capital. It uh, is not, that land does not own or owe any service or penance to any of our current institutions. It has merely been a historical capture of title and resource over that land. And the opportunity for uh, our society is to free up access to that land for the most desperate, the most needy, and the most uh, entrepreneurial at uh, no or very little administrative cost in order to meet some immediate needs. I'm not saying that's going to be the solution of the Policy Development Committee, but some of these opportunities are apparent and obvious, and no one's talking about it. So uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Peter. Um, and we're getting close to eight o'clock, so we'll be moving into the sort of official or the, the sort of ending this meeting and, and moving to the uh, sort of formal uh, part of the policy development meeting on this. So um, we will kind of go deeper into the sort of actual work, that, uh, further work that we need to do. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think uh, sort of as Peter sort of described, it's, it's just, it's a, it's a very, very complex one. Um, there are so many different aspects and it's also just uh, like I think it's important for us to be recognizing that yeah there's the systemic long-term issues things that need to be done um, but there are also people sort of having a really rough time now that deserve to be uh, to, to deserve to be looked after better as well so um, so yeah thank you thank you for that Peter um, Austin you had your hand up before you put it down but did you want to um, speak to that at all well yeah I mean I, I wanted to go back to interest rates um, and whether we have a position on that. And I, but I think I'd, I'd also like to add, you know, I think fundamentally it's not actually a complex topic. I think expensive housing is bad and cheap housing is good. And it's really very simple. And if someone's in a bad fix because they overpaid for a house, then they're already a victim and adding more victims to the pile of victims doesn't make, is, isn't the solution, right? At some stage we've got a, have you seen the boomer trolley problem? one where there's just a bunch of people on the tracks and they've all been, half of them have been run over. And there's like, would it be fair to stop the trolley now and stop the other people getting run over? Because, you know, I paid for my college or anyhow. Look, I just, I think that um, uh, we have to be in favor of cheap housing and affordable housing. Um, and if the, the problem with if people who are in mortgage stress, maybe you want to talk about debt forgiveness or something, but you know, there has to be a strong headline 
that that's the goal. Well, look, that, that's certainly the goal. That's that's not uh, that's fundamental to why we've been set up. And the title of the working group is over uh, achieving affordable housing in Australia. Um, the issue that sorry, one more thing. And the main driver, I think, is in, is interest rates. Low interest rates push up asset prices, right? And interest rates are low for a bunch of reasons we can talk about. But there was an RBA meeting today, and they raised interest rates again. And everyone in Australia is um you know sort of up in arms about it and i think that we should be the party for smart people that understand that actually the, the root cause here is the prices are too high and low interest rates drive high prices and that's that's where i'm at so austin are you saying if we just raise the interest rate even higher then suddenly that solves the housing crisis no but it doesn't solve the housing crisis but it's there's no way to get out of a bubble without popping a bubble, right? House prices have to come down and interest rates are not high. Interest rates are just above historic lows. What's, what are high are house prices. The reason people are having mortgage stress is not because interest rates are high. The reason people are having mortgage stress is because house prices are high. There's two variables in the mm -hmm. equation, right? Your principal and your interest. The interest isn't what's high, it's the principal, right? So it's crazy to think and, and the reason for that, it, it, it goes back to neoliberalism. Low interest rates are the silent, like, enabler of neoliberalism because you cut wages, you cut spending, you starve the economy of demand. And then what happens is the, um, uh, the Reserve Bank steps in and saves the day by cutting interest rates. And everyone says, see, everything's fine. House prices are going up. The economy is humming along. But really, it's all just fueled on cheaper and ever cheaper credit, which is why interest rates have been falling in a trend for 30 years, right? It's not like we just got like the, here. The, the business cycle. Well, the business, um, the, are, you, are you talking about a 30 year business cycle? Because there's been I, multiple recessions. I, I think we're going off on a tangent. I think. Yeah, like, so, uh, yeah. yeah I, may, I, may, I may step in here. Um, yeah, I mean, Austin, I think, um, yeah, the, the, and you have submitted some, some, some stuff that you've um, obviously put a lot of effort into as well that, um, that, that will be definitely part of the um the the process and the conversation um and um yeah to, so like there's a lot of stuff here to kind of and we might might, might continue this um sort of further on and just noting as well though that it is it's 801 now um and just to note as well just like the um all these discussions are, are fantastic and we but we do need to just we, we do want to just make sure that we are uh like the process we have uh, as i mentioned before um we want to uh, we're, we're not going to look uh, too. We don't want to get too into the weeds on specific implementations just um, sort of just yet, and especially tonight, um, uh, as we as we sort of just go through the sort of the, through the process there. So um, I'll just I'll pass to Andrea just real quick. Uh, if there's anything you else you'd like to cover, or, or just as we sort of reach the end of the member meeting. No, thank you, Michael. The last thing is just see you at the same time next month. Wednesday, 7th of June at 7 p.m. Eastern Time, first Wednesday of the month. And now I will take it to be that we are in the policy meeting. I'll stop the recording and we can start again if you want to record it. Okay, right, cool. Thank you, Andrew.